back and it's so, <clears throat> a corollary is so the easiest is uh, a corollary a corollary is something that follows immediately from either a proposition or a theorem it's like uh, <clears throat> maybe a particular choice kind of thing ha huh. so it's a particular case more or less i mean if you want to prove say that uh, uh, n plus n plus 1 is 2n suppose you prove n plus n is 2n and a corollary of that is 1 plus 1 is 2 so corollary is like a particular case or it follows immediately with very very min so there there's no there's no formal definition of all these things it's just that you say corollary if it for if what you the corollary follows very quickly from the theorem or proposition or whatever okay almost as a special case for a theorem is typically uh of so the difference between a theorem and a proposition is more difficult usually what happens is that propositions are basically easier theorems so if you are in your first standard what would be a, a theorem would probably be a proposition in your 10th standard basically what is a lemma lemma is an intermediate result just because something is a lemma doesn't mean it's easy it's an intermediate result that is used to prove a theorem or a proposition so that is a lemma so there is no real uh, there's no real nothing very concrete set in stone usually at least when i write papers you know the main result of my paper is a theorem and anything that is uh, not that that is some much easier to prove for me but it is not used anywhere else in the in the paper is usually called a proposition and something that is used often as an intermediate step in proving a proposition or a theorem is called a lemma and the special case of a theorem is often a corollary this is how i view it but different people have different uh, things i hope that answered the question uh, yeah 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 thank you yeah i think if there is any questions then participants will put a question at the end please 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 yeah please they have a doubt at the place of theorem and proposition mainly uh usually theorems are basically harder propositions if you will yeah so that's why it's the riemann mapping theorem and not the riemann mapping proposition because it's presumably a hard result but yes that anyway so uh again so the last time so we defined angle preserving maps once again what's an angle preserving map simply a map such that if you take any two curves uh the they go to two other curves so that the angles between these two are the same right so that's the definition of an angle preserving map we saw why to care about these things we prove that angle preserving maps are nothing but holomorphic that is analytic maps with non zero derivative so if the derivative is non zero and it's an analytic map it's angle preserving and vice versa okay we observed that if f is holomorphic and one to one then f prime is not zero so being one to one is good enough to guarantee that f prime is not zero but the other way around is not true i mean if you take e raised to z it is holomorphic its derivative is never zero but it's not one to one right uh and in fact being holomorphic and one to one meaning that f prime is non zero is not an easy result i mean it's not even true in the case of real numbers for instance in one way able calculus then we proved this rather important result called the open mapping theorem what is the open mapping theorem as the name suggests if you take a non constant holomorphic map it takes open sets to open sets open mapping theorem so it's a, it's a very suggestive name right and to prove this theorem we needed the maximum modulus principle yeah so the key ingredient was the maximum modulus principle then uh we saw that certain kinds of uh, holomorphic functions 
for them, you can make sense of uh, them even at a singularity. Like these are metamorphic functions, namely functions where the singularities are poles. They are not essential singularities. So when your singularity is a pole, you can sort of define the value of the function at that singularity to be infinity. And if you have, and you can also define one by infinity to be zero, and you can hope to be consistent. And indeed, you can be consistent. Uh, I mean, by pretending that infinity is the north pole of a sphere called the Riemann sphere, and the and the relationship between the sphere and the complex plane is through the stereographic projection. That is, you take a north pole, shine light upon the sphere, trace a light the light ray, it hits the sphere at one point, and that point goes to uh, the point on the equatorial plane. So every point on the com equatorial plane, which is the complex plane, gets mapped onto the sphere, and vice versa, except for the North Pole. The North Pole doesn't get mapped anywhere. It should be thought of as infinity. Okay? And we looked at what it meant for a, a map to be holomorphic from the Riemann sphere to itself. It's simply a metamorphic function on the complex plane, such that f of 1 by z is also metamorphic. Okay? So any questions from the last time before we move on? Yeah. yeah. Some authors uh, take the complex plane at the uh, south pole as tangent plane, and uh, some authors take as equatorial plane. Which uh, which is more appropriate for historical projection? Uh, I prefer the equatorial plane. You know, it just depends on your taste. Yeah, I prefer the equatorial plane. This formula formula is simpler. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other Sir. questions? Yeah. Sir, is there any relation with group of rigid motion? Because that no, also preserves no. angle. But that preserves distances also, and that's the crucial difference. These things don't preserve distances; they only preserve angles. Yes, sir. So but, there's no but real. It's, it's Jacobian is like. Orthogonal matrix, no, sir. Uh, Jacobian. Yeah, but, but say, no, no. But all I'm saying is very simple. The rigid motions preserve distances as well as angles. Conformal maps preserve only angles. So there's no real. Uh, I mean, rigid motions are special cases of conformal maps, but not the other way around. Okay. okay. Any other questions? All right, um, if there are no other questions, let's move on. So conformal maps in the Laplace equation. So suppose we consider the Laplacian of phi. Suppose phi is a C2 function on an open set V, a real valued C2 function, not complex valued, real valued. And suppose we consider the Laplacian of phi, which is d square phi by dx square, which we commonly write as phi xx plus d square phi by dy square, which is phi yy, and that's zero. This is called the Laplace equation. Functions satisfying these are called harmonic functions. The name harmonic comes from music, but that's a longer story. With phi equals uh, c on the boundary, right? So v is a set like this, and over here, phi is given to be c. c. So uh, suppose z equals u plus i v is f of w. W is x capital X plus cap, uh, i capital Y. Suppose this is a conformal map. All right. So in other words, let me draw a picture. This is u. This is v. This is f. This is phi to real numbers. And phi satisfies the Laplace equation on the set u, on the set v. and f is a map from u to p. Okay, the coordinates here, if you will, are capital X and capital Y. Here they are u comma p. Okay, but here it is w and here it is z. Right. Suppose it's a conformal map. What's a conformal map? Holomorphic one to one. Right. 
and on to. Okay? Such that it takes the boundary to the boundary. Okay? So it's not only a conformal map on U, it extends continuously to the boundary. Okay? And it takes the boundary to the boundary. The fact that it takes the boundary to the boundary follows from the continuous extension in a sense, but let's make it an assumption for simplicity. So it takes the boundary to the boundary. Now, what we will do is the following. We have a new function from u to r. We are basically, this is supposed to be like change of variables in some sense. You're changing variables. Right? So you get a new function, which is phi of f of uh, capital X comma capital Y. This is a new function. The old function satisfies this equation. What happens to the new function? Okay? When you change your variables, what happens? That's what we want to check. Okay? The claim is, to kill the suspense, the claim is that it will satisfy this equation again. Okay? But to prove such a claim, you need to calculate lots of derivatives. Right? So it's a painful calculation, but we shall do it nonetheless. OK, so this is phi composed with f and d squared phi composed with f uh, with respect uh, d squared by d capital X squared of phi composed with f plus d squared capital Y squared of p composed with y. So this is, let's take one derivative at a time, d, d by dx of d by dx of this. Yeah? Now what is d by d capital X of this? By the chain rule and multivariable calculus, well, let's just recall. Sorry, I'll charge my stylus the next time. So I don't have to write like a Neanderthal with my finger. But so what is this? This is d by dx. Very simply, it is basically phi of uh, u comma v. And u and v are both functions of x and y. So it's d phi du du dx plus d phi d v d uh, maybe instead of u and v I should have written small x and small y I'm very sorry maybe I'll write this as small x and small y so it's d phi d small x d small x by d capital x sorry I, I understand uh, my notation is all screwed up but it's d phi d small small u u capital x d phi d b v capital x with respect to capital X, likewise for capital Y, OK? So now what we can do is ux equals vy, uy is minus vx. Why? Because f is a holomorphic map. So what you can do is that uh, you can convert, you can, uh, let's see, you can say that, what did we say? You can write this uy is minus vx and ux is vy, right? So I'll write that here. And I'll take a derivative again. Now you'll get something very complicated. First of all, you have to take the derivative of this plus this with respect to x and this with respect to y, this with respect to y. How do you do this? You use this, do this using the product rule. And again, to do this, you have to use the chain rule again to do each of these. So this is u x x. If you differentiate this, if you want to differentiate this, again, you have to use the chain rule like this. So you'll get a complicated expression. Okay? By the way, I strongly urge you to do these calculations yourself. Just seeing the expression is not good enough. Only then will you. Uh, and. Even with your students, I would urge you to bring them up to the board and do these calculations so that they become comfortable. Yeah. So when you differentiate, you get this monstrosity of an expression. But happily enough, certain things will cancel out. 
This can be simplified using the Cauchy Riemann equations to the following. So if you use the Cauchy Riemann equations, I'll just give you an example. Ux is Vy. So let us see. Ux is Vy, right? Phi xy is the same as phi yx because phi is c2, so these two will cancel out. Likewise, certain other cancellations occur, and happily enough, you get a very pleasant expression. The Laplacian in the new coordinates equals the Laplacian in the old coordinates times this function. Very pleasant, yeah? So, since we know that the Laplacian in the old coordinates is zero, so is the Laplacian of this function. So why should you care about this fact? Moreover, the value at the boundary is preserved. So meaning that if we can solve the Laplace equation on an easy domain, like the unit disk, like the unit disk centered at the origin, Yeah. Then we and we can find the co conformal map to a more complicated domain. In fact, the other way around. Uh, or maybe like this. So suppose you have a complicated domain. Suppose this is a simpler domain, right? Uh, and you want to solve the Laplace equation here. Suppose you find a map from the unit disk to this, uh, or rather, maybe the other way. The other way around. Sorry. Maybe you, whoops. Sorry. If you want to find a harmonic function here, if uh, with a certain boundary condition, and if you, you use the same boundary condition, you find one here, not the same boundary condition. Basically, this goes to this on the boundary. So at this point, whatever the value is, is at this, this the same value over here. You can solve this. This is easy, quote unquote. And if you find this map, then you can solve it here. Okay. So the, the, the difficulty would then boil down to finding out this map. Okay. So we can solve it on the latter. Okay. So this is a beautiful way of solving a partial differential equation or a complicated region using a solution of simpler region if we can find this conformal map. How do you do that? That's not easy, by the way, but at least we know something here. A useful thing to keep in mind is that if f from u to v is conformal and g from v to w is conformal, then f composed with g from u to w is conformal. Why is this true? Why is this fact true? Sir, so one one means and this differentiating give one u. Sorry, one one. It's of course if f is one to one, g is one to one. F composed with g is one to one. That's good. What about the holomorphic part? So holomorphic composition of two holomorphic function is again a holomorphic function. Oh, right, right. It's a holomorphic function. I hope you have seen it. If you haven't, the easiest way to prove it is the composition of C1 functions is C1. And you can use the chain rule to show that the composition satisfies the cauchy riemann equations. Okay? It's easiest in the sense that it does not require much thought, but it requires a lot of calculation. There are some proofs which are easy in the sense that they don't require a lot of calculation, but they, they require a lot of intelligence to think of the proof. They are not easy, to be honest. Yeah. But anyway, so this is the case. So, so my point is, sometimes it, if you have a complicated domain, you can make it slightly less complicated, and then a little less complicated, and finally become the unit disk, for example. You can do it in stages. That's the point of this observation. Okay. Okay. So this is the chain rule. F composed with G is holomorphic, and it's one to one. All right. So let's look at examples of conformal maps. Yeah f of z equals z squared, it's not one to one, right? It's, it's holomorphic. It's not one to one. Well, it is if you take the open semi-disk 
to this. So in other words, if you take this to this, this is holomorphic and it is one to one. Why is it one to one? If you give me anything here, right? What is this unique square root here? You just halve the angle, so you'll get an angle between 0 and pi, and just take the square root of the distance. So you'd get a unique complex number here. Okay? So everything is unique. I mean, th we are throwing this part out. Okay? So this is a, it takes the open semi disk to the unit disk minus the non negative, the positive real axis. We are throwing that out. Okay, so this is a conformal map. Okay. So when you say something is one-to-one -one or not, that depends on your domain, as you very well know from inverse trigonometry. I mean, in that case, the range, but in general. Okay, you, you, the domain and the range affect whether something is one-to-one -one or not. Yeah? So suppose we want to take the unit. So, so this is how we can take... Uh, this open semi is centered at zero to this. What if we want to do something slightly different? Oops, sorry. What if we want to take the open unit semi is centered not at zero, but at one plus square root of minus one, right? To the same place. Suppose I want to do, maybe not this, suppose I have something here, not at the origin, and I want to do the same thing. What I can do is I can do it in stages. I can take this to this first, and then this to this. And we first translate this way, so that 1 plus square root of i minus 1 goes to the origin. First you do this, and then you do this. And then, to, the, to make the center of the unit semitas the origin, then apply z squared, meaning the final map is the composition of these two, which is this. Okay? So it helps to break down what you want into tiny little pieces, and each piece you can handle. Yeah? If we further want the image to be centered at some other point, as in, instead of doing, if, instead of wanting this, suppose we want it to be centered at, let's say, minus 1. Then you do the same thing, and you translate the image. Okay, we translate again. So the answer would have been this thing minus 1. Okay. So this is a very straightforward and silly kind of an observation, but it's very useful. Okay? So you can, by, by doing these translations, you can assume that your favorite point in the domain is the origin, your favorite point in the range is the origin also. Okay? One can use square root of z with the right branch to do the inverse operations in the sense that if I ask you the opposite, uh, question. Make this into this. You can just take the inverse of this function, square root of z, except you have to use the right, the correct branch of the square root. Uh, so I, I hope you've seen this word, uh, branch. Has this been mentioned by my colleagues? Yeah, yeah, it was discussed. Okay, wonderful. All right. Here's another example, f of z equals e raised to z. It is, of course, not one to one when you look at the entire complex plane. However, it takes, so what, how does e raised to z fail to be one to one? e raised to z1 equals e raised to z2, if and only if e raised to z1 minus z2 is one. When is e raised to anything one? When, uh, when uh, this uh, imaginary part of z is a multiple of 2 pi i, an integer multiple of 2 pi i, right? So in particular, if you want to make it 1 to 1, you should take a narrow strip in the y, 
y direction, right? Something like this. So in the, if this is pi, like so this is 0 and this is pi, for example, then it is 1 to 1 here. The exponential map is 1 to 1 here because you can get a unique angle in this uh, domain. Okay, And it is it takes it where? To the upper half space. How do I know that? So it's not very difficult. e raised to z is e raised to x into e raised to i y. So since there is no restriction on x, that means the, the radius of the complex number, the distance from the origin, can be any positive number. right? However, there's a restriction on y. That means the angle should be only between 0 and pi. That means it has to be the upper half space. Okay. So it's very easy to see that e raised to z takes this particular open strip in a one-to-one -one holomorphic manner to the upper half space. Yeah? What if I want to do the following? What if I want to uh, instead take this, not to the upper half space, but if I want to take it to, let's say, the left half? OK, if I want to do this instead of this, what should I do? Well, you can take this to this first, and there's a way to go from here to here. How? You can simply rotate this thing by 90 degrees. What operation accomplishes rotation of complex numbers by 90 degrees? Simply multiplying by the complex number i. So if I take i times e raised to z, it takes this particular strip to the left half space. Yeah? And likewise, so, so a combination of these rotations and scalings and translations can already do lots of things. right? On the other hand, if I rotate the domain, then instead of this, it takes a rotated strip to the upper half space. So what strip? Does it take this strip to the upper half space, or does it take the left strip? Does it take the left one? I mean, in the sense, does it take this to this, or does it take the right one to this? In other words, my question is, does it take 0 less than x less than pi to the upper half space, or does it take minus pi to the upper half space? Which of these? <clears throat> Lift off. Uh, actually, not quite. It takes this one. Why? Because if you take the right half, when you multiply by i, it gets rotated by 90 degrees. So this becomes the x-axis, and this becomes this. If I were to just write formulae, ah, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, you're right, you're right. It's, it's the other way around. Let's, let's actually just write formulae. If I take, instead of this, if I take e raised to i times x plus i y, this is e raised to i x minus y. Okay, so let us see. So what do we want? We want, uh, so if x is between 0 and pi, then this is in the upper half space, because uh, this is e raised to i theta, right? When theta lies between 0 and pi, you're in good shape. So yeah, so in other words, it takes this right half to the upper half space. So not the left half, it takes the right half. Indeed, you can very well imagine if I take this strip and if I multiply by i, I'm going to rotate this by 90 degrees, so it becomes like this. Okay, It'll rotate it by anti-clockwise. Okay. Right, so in other words, now we have one more thing at our disposal. We can rotate the image, we can rotate the range, we can translate the image, we can 
translate the sorry the domain and the, we can translate the range okay let's do one more example and this one is also an important example f of z equals 1 by z takes the open unit disk minus the origin The punk, this is sometimes called the punctured open unit disk because the, the, you put a hole in the unit disk, a puncture. To the exterior of it, what does that mean? That means if I have anything here, if I apply 1 by z, it goes here, outside the unit disk. Right? Because why? Because if I take 1 by z and take the magnitude, it's 1 by mod z, so if mod z is less than 1, this is larger than 1. Okay? And this is 1 to 1. Likewise, it takes the exterior to the interior minus the origin. So if I, it takes anything here to this. So sometimes this is called inversion. Okay? All right. So as a homework exercise, you will see that f of z equals half of z plus 1 by z takes the punctured open unit disk, this thing, to everything except, very, very interestingly, except the interval between minus 1 and 1 on the x-axis. Except for this thing, everything else confirmably. Very curious, very interesting math. Takes a, the punctured unit disk to C minus minus 1, 1 confirmably. Okay. So th this might raise a question: how the hell do you know the image? Right? It sounds like, I mean these these are very easy. This example. Uh, this one, etc. You can very quickly see what the image should be. This one is, it looks very formidable. And indeed, it's not trivial. In your homework, I gave it as a guided exercise, which is, uh, uh, there's a small elegant trick. But in general, how does one find out the image? So note that, so maybe I'll tell you, maybe I should have written the trick earlier, but the idea is, if I give you an arbitrary conformal map, what you can try to do is to see where it takes the, uh, so from the unit disk to somewhere, you can look at where it takes the radial lines and where it takes these circles. Okay, It'll take them also to things like this only. Like what I mean is, suppose I take the unit disk. And if I want to find out the image of a conformal map, I just need to look at these radial lines. They'll look like this, whatever. These, uh, these radial lines and these circles, they'll probably look like this, right? So you can get to know what the shape of the image looks like if you know these things, the shapes of these things. In a sense, you can get to know what the image looks like, okay? and vice versa. Okay? All right. Or sometimes if you want to look at all of C, you can just look at, I mean, not, not maybe these or maybe these. Depends. Right? It's, it's, it's an art more than a science, but something like this. Okay? So if we know this, notice that we can do something very interesting. If you take cosine z, what is cosine z? It is half of e raised to iz plus e raised to minus iz, right? By Euler's formula, by, by writing the uh, the Taylor expansion, for example, right? Now, this function, suppose you want to know what the range of the cosine z function looks like, okay? This is a composition of a rotation with the previous function. In other words, I can take z to iz, and then apply this, right? So if I take the punctured unit disk, that goes to the punctured unit disk. And I know where this goes. This goes to C except for minus 1, 1. Except for this, everything else, right? 
So this takes this to this. So cosine z takes this, this piece to this, right? So, so as I said, uh, sketching what happens to the coordinate grid under these maps is instructive. That is either these radial lines and these circles or the usual Cartesian coordinates, the polar coordinates or Cartesian coordinates. Look at the coordinate grid, whichever is appropriate, and see what happens under these conformal maps. Then you can get a rough idea of what the image looks like. And this this stuff is fun. I mean, you can give like, problems of this sort to your students and see. All right. So we will uh, focus our attention in this lecture, possibly a part of the next lecture too. I don't remember, but these lectures we will focus our attention to some very specific kinds of. Uh, examples of conformal maps okay these conformal maps are, are called p uh, are called mebius maps uh, these mebius maps uh, this mebius is the same mebius of the mebius strip that is if you take a piece of paper a rectangular piece of paper and what you do is you twist this end and identify with this, right? So, so what you do is it's commonly written like this. You take this point and identify with this. You take this point, identify with this. You twist it and then glue it to this edge. You'll get a fairly strange looking uh, piece of paper that has no inside or outside. It's a very interesting object. It's the same mathematician who came up with these. Mebius maps. So recall translations, that is z goes to z plus a, rotations plus scaling, that is z goes to 2z scales. Okay, it's like changing the units, right? And z goes to something like i z rotates. I mean, in fact, z goes say i pi by 4 z will rotate by pi by 4. And if you take the composition of these two, 2i two pi by 4z, z goes to 2z, uh, z goes to 2e raised to i pi by 4z, will rotate z by 45 degrees and then scale it by two units, right? Inversions. Inversions means that you basically invert, take this to this and this to this, okay? So these, uh, recall these uh, conformal maps. These are conformal maps of the Riemann sphere. What the hell does a conformal map of the Riemann sphere even mean? What do you think it means? So we know what a conformal map from a domain in complex plane to another domain in the complex plane, what that means. But what does a conformal map of the Riemann sphere mean? What the, what's the meaning of that? An extended complex plane. Okay, that is the Riemann sphere, sure. But what is the definition of a conformal map of the Riemann sphere? That's my question. All right, so what is the definition of a holomorphic map from the Riemann sphere to itself? We did this the last, uh, in the last lecture. What do I mean by a holomorphic map from the Riemann sphere or the extended complex plane, what do you, whatever you want to call it, to itself? Is a meromorphic uh, map from uh, C to C uh -huh. uh, and F of uh, one by z is also metamorphic. Very good, right? So basically, a, a map of the extended complex plane or Riemann sphere or whatever to itself is simply a metamorphic function such that f of one by z is also metamorphic. 
In what way is it a map from the extended complex plane to itself? What is a meromorphic function? The only thing, it's a, basically it's more or less like a holomorphic function except it has singularities which are poles. So take all the poles to infinity and take infinity to wherever f of 1 by z takes 0 to. f of 1 by z is also meromorphic, no? So it takes 0 somewhere, meaning suppose g of z is f of 1 by z, either 0 is a pole, in which case take it to infinity, Otherwise, zero goes somewhere, so take it. So take infinity there. Okay. That is a holomorphic map from the Riemann sphere to itself. A conformal map is simply a one-to-one -one holomorphic map from the Riemann sphere to itself. The inverse of this is also going to be a one-to-one -one holomorphic map from the Riemann sphere to itself. That is what a conformal map to the Riemann sphere is. In other words, in plain English, you can just extend these to infinity also and to places where this becomes infinity. Okay? Basically, we are including infinity. In other words, uh, infinity under a translation goes to infinity. Under a rotation, it goes to infinity. By the way, A is non-zero here. And under an, an inversion, infinity goes to zero. And zero is a pole, it goes to infinity. Okay? So that's what happens to the Riemann sphere. By the way, it's, it's a very fascinating exercise to do the following. It, look at the stereographic projection, right? When you look at, when you do a translation, what really happens to the sphere? That is, if you take z to z plus a, and you map this to the sphere using the stereographic projection, and you map this to the sphere, what is really happening to the sphere? What do you think happens to the sphere? If you take a translation of the complex plane and look at what happens to the sphere under the stereographic projection, what do you think happens? Oh, sorry. What, what I mean is, I'll just ask the question again. Suppose I take z goes to z plus 1. Okay? This is a map from C to C. Right? So you can think of it as a map from the Riemann sphere to itself. Right? It takes infinity to infinity. It takes the north pole to itself. It takes this... Okay? So... So where do you think, uh, so the south pole is, corresponds to z equals 0. So the south pole does not go to itself, it goes somewhere else. It goes to this point. Anyway, think about what this is doing uh, to the Riemann sphere. More, it, something that is a little easier is what happens to uh, these things, rotations plus. Sir, origin is shifted from one to another, zero to another point. That is true, but it's instructive to look at what is exactly happening on the sphere itself. But anyway, it maybe, maybe if I look at something like this, this is a little easier. Suppose I take z goes to i z, that's a little easier. Then what happens is the sphere gets rotated. Even if you take an inversion, it corresponds to some sort of a rotation of the sphere, roughly. It's instructive to see what these things do to the sphere, actually. Okay. Um, anyway. So what does this statement mean? It means whenever we want to deal with infinity, we use an inversion and study w equals 0. So you have to be careful with things like this. This is the only thing that can go wrong, and these are not defined. You have to be careful. Okay? When you look at examples, it will be very clear as to what I mean. So these, these maps, translations, rotations plus scaling, and inversions, they're all special cases of this map. Why are they all special cases of this map? If I put c to be 0, 
what will I get? I'll get A Z plus B over D. So suppose I now put D to be one, and if I put A to be one, then I'll get Z plus B, which is a translation. If I put B to be zero and D to be one, I'll get AZ, which is this. If instead I take A to be zero, B to be one, D to be zero, and C to be one, I'll get an inversion. So they're all special cases of this map. Okay. However, there is a big problem with this map. The problem is, what if you ever encounter zero by zero? That's a very dangerous situation, right? You don't ever want to encounter that situation, right? So when can that happen? If AZ plus B is zero and CZ plus D, D is zero, then what happens? Then AZ equals minus B, CZ equals minus D. So ADZ equals minus B, C, Z, right? A, D, Z is, uh, is basically minus. So if I multiply by B, C, Z, it will become B, sorry. This, right? So, so since this is the case, uh, when is this going to be true? This is going to be true either when Z is 0 in which case b is 0 and d is 0. Or if z is non-zero, ad is bc. But even in this case, ad is bc, right? So in that case, if ad is bc, f of z is a constant for all z. And we never count constants as conformal maps. Why? Because they are not one to one. So we want to ignore this possibility so we do not want constant maps and hence always impose ad minus bc to be non-zero okay now this is a map from c to c does this give you a map of the riemann sphere to itself well for that we have to know whether this is a meromorphic map. Of course, it's a meromorphic map because the only thing that can go wrong is when the denominator is 0, and that's a pole. So when the denominator is 0, it goes to infinity. And uh, f of 1 by z is also a meromorphic map because it is a plus bz by c plus dz. It's exactly of the same form. So that's also a meromorphic map. Therefore, this can be thought of as a map from the Riemann sphere to itself. And what, where does it take this pole to? It takes it to infinity. That is when CZ plus D is 0, or in other words, Z is minus D by C. You're dividing a non-zero number by 0, and we declared it to be infinity. Likewise, when F, F of infinity is A by C. Why is this true? This is reasonable. Why is this true? How can I figure this out? Divide by z. Okay. Numerator and denominator. Okay, you divide the numerator and denominator by z, then. Then you take this to be infinity, and we declared this by infinity to be 0, right? That's one way. Another way is to say that you take f of 1 by z. This is a more systematic way, the one way I'm going to tell you right now. Take f of 1 by z. It is a plus bz by c plus dz. And substitute z equals 0 here. So this is 0, this is 0, it's a by c. Okay, that is the correct definition of f of infinity. You take f of 1 by z and substitute z equals 0. Okay? Wonderful. So. So this can be thought of as a map of the extended complex plane to itself. It takes this point to infinity, and it takes infinity to this point. Okay. Now, clearly, compositions of these con maps are also conformal maps of the sphere if AD minus BC is non-zero. This is not so clear, 
this will be a part of your homework. That is, if I take two such maps, and if I compose them, that is, if I apply them one after the other, they will continue to be of the same type. OK? OK, maybe this is not a part of your homework. I'm actually doing it here. So, uh, so first of all, compositions of these maps uh, I think I was trying to say something else here. Um, this part, please, what I'm trying to say here, I mean, ignore the word word indeed here. These two are two separate sentences. What I'm trying to say here is that these maps are actually one to one. Forget about this. Maybe what I'm saying is clearly these maps are conformal maps of the sphere. I should have uh, written this more clearly. I was mixing up two things. What I meant is not compositions. These maps are conformal maps of the sphere. Not also, just conformal maps. Why are they, they conformal maps? What is a conformal map? It is what is a conformal map of the Riemann sphere? It's a meromorphic map from C to C such that f of 1 by z is one meromorphic. That is true. And it is 1 to 1. Why is it 1 to 1? Suppose these two are equal. OK? Then that is true if and only if this happens. And therefore, these two are equal if and only if AD minus BC is non-zero. And that is what happens here. That is the assumption made here. So my point is, these maps are conformal maps of the Riemann sphere. Sorry, any questions? No, actually, uh, that sentence is also correct because that uh, bilinear transformation can be written as a composition of those elementary transformations. Maybe indeed, with that, it may be correct. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Maybe that is what I meant, but yes, I'll say, say that later also again. But thanks, right. yeah. So there is no mistake that is correct. Also. Yeah, right. right. So, uh, so yeah, the comment made just now, I'll just clarify that in a moment. Just let me just finish uh, this point. So these maps, AZ plus B by CZ plus D, where AD minus BC is non-zero, uh, they are called Möbius maps, or sometimes they're called fractional linear transformations. Why are they called fractional linear transformations? But technically, this is a linear map. This is not a linear map. It is the correct name for this is an affine map. But anyway, even if you want to call this a linear map, this is a ratio of two such maps. That's why they're called fractional linear transformations or maybe as maps. Okay? AZ plus B by CZ plus D provided AD minus BC is non-zero. This is crucial. Okay? So. So yeah, the comment that was made just now, that, that'll come up in, probably in this slide anyway. So I'll just uh, move on to this. So it turns out that every conformal map from the Riemann sphere to itself is a Möbius map. In other words, these are the only conformal maps in the Riemann sphere to itself. There are no more. This is not trivial to prove. It requires some more mathematical machinery, and we will do we will prove the statement, but it requires a lot more work. Okay. Before we discuss the proof, we need to look at some properties of Mabius maps. Okay. So firstly, and uh, this is related to the somewhat unclear statement in the previous slide. So this will be a homework. A composition of two Möbius maps is also a Möbius map. What does that mean? If I take a map of the type AZ plus B by CZ plus C, where AD minus BC is non-zero, and another map of that type, like let's say alpha Z plus beta by gamma Z plus delta, where alpha delta minus gamma beta is non-zero, if I compose them, that is if I apply them one after the other, then the resulting map, I'm sorry, the resulting map is also going to be of this type. What do I mean by this type? I mean it's going to be it's going to look like this where this condition is met. Okay. 
Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's very easy to see that it will be of this type, as in it will certainly be of this type. The fact that this condition is met follows from this point, that the, uh, the composition of two one-to-one -one maps is one-to-one, -one and, um, and this sort of a map is one-to-one -one always because of this condition. Okay. Right. Sorry about this. Right. So this is a part of the homework. Every Möbius map is invertible. It's a one-to-one -one map from the Riemann sphere to itself. It's not shocking. It's invertible. The composition is associative. Of course, composition of functions is associative. So sure. The identity map is a Möbius map. Of course, Z goes to Z is a Möbius map. So the Möbius maps form a group. I hope uh, everyone uh, here knows what a group is, right? So the collection of all Möbius maps forms a group. Now, of course, the, the real question is, why the hell should you care? I mean, OK, it forms a group. So what can you do with it? It's just convenient language as far as uh, elementary complex analysis is concerned. It, it has no deeper meaning. Uh, in more advanced mathematics, it, it does help with other things and so on. But as of elementary mathematics, it's just convenient language. It's an infinite group. Maybe if your students ever ask you to give them an, a nice example of an infinite group, I'm sure you can give lots of examples like Z with addition. But this is also a very nice example. It's called a Möbius group. And it's denoted like this because of this theorem. Every conformal map of the Riemann sphere to itself, that is, every automorphism of the Riemann sphere is a Möbius transformation. And therefore, this is sometimes denoted like this. Okay. All right. Moreover, Möbius maps. Uh -huh. This is the comment that was just made. Are compositions of translations, rotations plus scalings, and inversions. Meaning that every map of this sort can be obtained using these three kinds of maps applied one after the other in the correct order. Okay, A finite if you take these maps and apply them one after the other a finite number of times, a correct collection of these maps, you'll get every map of this sort. It's a very, very nice uh, property of Möbius maps. Right? In, a, in group theoretic terms, this group is generated by these kinds of elements. Okay? This is very, very, very helpful, as we will see in proofs later on. Every Möbius transformation Transformation can be obtained using this, the, the, uh, this, and these, these three kinds. Okay. This will be a part of your homework, I think. Yeah, I, I didn't prove it here, so there's also a part of your homework. Okay. All right. So, any questions so far? Right. Let's move on. So maybe maybe it's maps fixed. Point. Excuse me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, set up all Mobius transformations is forms a group. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, we can if we can say that the, the elements of automorphism from C cap is also Mobius transformation. No, we can't. Part. No, no, we can't. That is a theorem. That's a that's a difficult theorem that we'll prove later on. I am on, only I am only saying that. The fact that the, the Möbius transformations are all automorphisms is a, is a theorem. But because of that, the do notation is this. The, the reason Möb the Möbius group is denoted like this is because of this theorem. Maybe you can, maybe I, I'll just remove this if this is confusing. It's not relevant. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. So, any other questions? Right, let's move on. So fixed points. A Möbius map can have fixed points, namely points Z that are not moved. In other words, f of Z equals Z. That is AZ plus B divided by CZ plus D is Z. 
let's see what kind of fixed points it can have. So the point is that uh, notice that Mobius maps are defined on the extended complex plane, right? So you have to treat the cases where z is infinity and z is minus d over c sep uh, sorry, sp separately, OK? So suppose z is infinity. Then this thing is defined to be a by c. Suppose infinity is a fixed point. That means a by c is infinity. That means c is non-zero. I mean, c is 0 and a is not 0, OK? Of course, ad is not equal to bc. So if c is 0, then this is 0. So a and d are not 0, right? So if z, if infinity is a fixed point, that means c is 0, which means in that case, the map is precisely of this type. It's a composition of a scaling plus a translation plus rotation. In other words, infinity is a fixed point if and only if the Möbius map is of this type, OK? So in this case, there is exactly one fixed point, and that is infinity. Right. I mean, not exactly one, one fixed point. It is, sorry, it has, it, is, it has a fixed point, which is infinity. It can have other fixed points, too, which we'll just find out in a moment. So in, suppose it's in, in this case, let's try to find out all the other fixed points. Uh, it's actually az plus b over d. I forgot the d. But that is a by d, z plus b by d. If I want, I can define this as some a prime and this as b prime. And it'll look like this. Okay. But anyway, so if az plus b by d equals z, and z is not infinity, then z is equal to b by d minus a. Yeah? So if a is equal to d, then again z is going to be infinity. And b is non-zero, then, then z is going to be infinity. So in other words, in other words, the map z goes to z has infinitely many fixed points, of course, many fixed points. The map z goes to z plus b has exactly one fixed point, namely infinity. Every The map z goes to az plus b, where a is not equal to 1. Uh, and b is not equal to 0, that has two fixed points, namely infinity and this. In fact, even if b is 0, that's not a problem. It has two fixed points, this and this. Okay? Right. So, 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 all right. So that's that. The other situation is, Ah, okay. So that is this, this particular thing. So suppose c is not 0. If c is not 0, then the map is of the type az plus b by cz plus d. Infinity is not a fixed point. Okay, if infinity is a fixed point, only when c is 0. So here, infinity is not a fixed point. Okay. Now, uh, if c is non-zero and the denominator is 0, then this becomes infinity, which is not possible because this is not equal to infinity because c is not equal to zero. All right. So if c is non-zero, the only fixed points it can have will satisfy this equation. You multiply this with this, and you'll get a quadratic equation. Therefore, you get this quadratic equation: c z square plus d minus a z minus b equals zero. Therefore, there are at most two fixed points in this case, okay? because there are two roots of this quadratic equation. There could be only one root also. When can there be only one root? When the discriminant is equal to 0. In this case, there's exactly one root. Otherwise, there are two roots. So the, the, the roots are given by the familiar quadratic formula. 
So if the discriminant uh, is b squared minus, so it's minus 4bc. I'm sorry about that. So b squared uh, is, if a minus d whole square is minus 4bc, then we have coincident roots equal, both are equal to this. Okay. If not, we have two fixed points. To summarize, we have either one or two fixed points or, sorry, infinitely many. This is for Z goes to Z. I forgot to write that down. I'm sorry about that. So for Mobius maps, have either infinitely many fixed points or one or two fixed points. Okay. So one fixed point occurs either for pure translate, the, the exactly one fixed point case occurs either in this case when it's a translation that is at infinity or in this case. Okay, there I forgot a minus here. In every other case, you have either two fixed points. I mean, Z goes to Z, you have infinitely many fixed points. But in every other case, you have two fixed points. While these two one fixed point cases appear different, they are actually secretly almost the same. Okay. So I'm saying that one fixed point occurs, exactly one fixed point occurs either when this happens or when this happens, right? And these two appear to be two different cases, but actually they're one and the same thing in disguise. Okay. One of them is wearing a mask, which you're not able to see. Indeed, suppose you take the one, suppose you take this case, you have exactly one fixed point when the discriminant is non-zero, then what you can do is the following interesting thing. You can send it to infinity using this particular Möbius map. Okay? You can send any point you want to infinity using Möbius maps. How? Just take one by z minus gamma. When, when z equals gamma, you get one by zero, this is infinite. Right? So in other words, in this case, gamma goes to infinity. This is a very nice little operation. Okay, what this does is that it takes infinity to infinity. Why? Uh, infinity is taken by G inverse to gamma. F takes this to, to uh, F takes it to F takes gamma to gamma, it's a fixed point. G takes gamma to infinity. So this is a Möbius map. Why is it a Möbius map? Because Möbius maps, we, I told you that in your homework, you, you show that it's a group. So this sort of a thing is a Möbius map. It takes infinity to infinity. And crucially, F of Z equals Z, if and only if, if and only if G of F of G inverse Z equals Z, that is, if and only if G of F of W That means that this has the same number of fixed points as F. Okay? In other words, this case and this case are secretly one and the same. You can make this case into this case using this nice little transformation. If you're familiar with group theory, such a, an operation is called conjugation. In group theory, a conjugate of a, of a group element is like this. If you conjugate f by this g, then these two are the same. They're conjugates of each other. Okay? So thus, h of infinity is infinity. And H has exactly one fixed point, which means H is a pure translation. Okay, so pure translations are conjugates of the case where the discriminant is zero. Okay. Any questions so far about fixed points before we move on to another property?
I think there are no questions. <laughs> so, uh, so, so the next uh, order of business is the number of parameters. So the question is, how many free parameters determine a MUPS map uniquely? Okay. So a MUPS map, there are lots of MUPS maps, right? I mean, if you choose values of A, B, C, and D, so that AD minus BC is non-zero, you get a MUPS map. Then, and for every such choice, you get a MUPS map. So how many free parameters determine a MUPS map uniquely? How many do you think? Three. Why three? There are four numbers, no? A, B, C, D. But to, by choosing three, we can get the another one to each side. Not quite. No, 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 no. no, no. A, B minus B, C is non-zero. Non-zero, that's all. So naive. one constant. Sorry? We have four constant A, B, C, D. We can divide one constant. Right. That's exactly what happens. So naively, it seems that we need four complex numbers, A, B, C, and D. However, if you rescale these numbers by a complex number, a non-zero complex number, it does not change the map. That is, this is the same as this. So by rescaling, you can assume that if, if one of these is non-zero, surely one of these is non-zero, you can assume that that is equal to one. That's equivalent to dividing by that constant. So secretly, you, you only have three free parameters, not four. Okay? Thus, we only have three free complex parameters. So we expect that there exists a unique Mubius map mapping three given distinct points in the Riemann sphere to three other given distinct points. In other words, you have three free parameters at your disposal. So if you give me three complex points, you should be able to map them to three other complex points by tweaking these three free parameters. That's what we expect. And we expect that there's only a unique map that does the job, yeah? Because you would have exhausted all your degrees of freedom, roughly speaking, okay? So indeed, this expectation is correct, okay? We shall prove that Z1, Z2, and Z3 can be mapped uniquely to 0, 1, and infinity using a Mobius transformation. Okay. By the way, since some of you asked me the difference between, say, a proposition and a corollary, this is a proposition. It's not quite a theorem because it's not such a hard result to prove. It's a proposition. You can, it can also be a lemma because it, it, it's useful in other places. But uh, as a corollary of this proposition, this expectation follows. This is a corollary. Why? Because it follows very easily from the proposition. How? Because if you, if you can map any three things to 0, 1, and infinity, and if you want to map these three to these three, what should you do? You should simply map these three to this, these three to this, and take the inverse. So you go from here to here, and then here to here. By composition, we can uniquely map Z1, Z2, Z3 to W1, W2, W3. Why is it unique? Suppose you have two such maps, right? Then what happens is that using uh, the inverse, you have a, a, a map from uh, that takes Z1, Z2, Z3 to Z1, Z2, Z3, but it is not the identity map. But that's a problem because you can take Z1, Z2, Z. I mean, why is that a problem? Because, uh, it, for example, if you take, you, you can you can first map Z1, Z2, Z3 to this, and there's only one map that takes 0, 1, infinity to 0, 1, infinity because of this statement. So this is a corollary. So the point, the real difficulty would lie in proving this.
So how do you map these three points? Assume that none of Z1, Z2, or Z3 is infinity. Okay. If one of them is infinity, then it's not very hard. I'll come to it in a moment. But let's assume none of them is infinity. So we want Z1 to go to 0, Z2 to go to 1, and Z3 to go to infinity. Since Z1 goes to 0, f of z is of this type. Why? Because a z1 plus b is 0. So that means b is minus a z1. So it's of this type. Since z3 goes to infinity, if you substitute z equals z3, you'll get this. When can something go to infinity? Precisely when the denominator is 0. So this is 0. That means uh, d is minus cz3. In other words, this is c times z minus z3. However, a by c can be denoted as the constant a. You can just write a by c as another constant. If you want, you can write it as a prime, but I wrote it as a. Okay. Now z2 goes to 1. Therefore, a z2 minus z1 divided by z2 minus z3 equals 1. So you can solve for a as z2 minus z3 over z2 minus z1. Very trivial, right? Therefore, f of z is actually z minus z1 times z2 minus z3 divided by z2 minus z1, z minus z3. So, so this very easy thing, it's a proposition. That's why it's not a theorem. It's so trivial. Maybe we can call it a lemma also. It might be useful elsewhere, but not exactly. Right. So therefore, using the corollary of this proposition, we can map any three points on the plane to three other distinct points, provided none of them, uh, provided uh, any three points on the plane, not on the extended plane, not on C hat because we have not dealt with the case of infinity yet. So suppose one of them is infinity, suppose Z1 is infinity, then infinity should go to zero, right? What is F of infinity? By definition, it is A by C. It is zero, that means A is zero. So F of Z is of this type. It's B divided by CZ plus D. Since C is non-zero, we can divide by C and we can call this as b and this as d. Okay. Now, suppose uh, since z1 goes to 0 and z3 goes to infinity, that means when z3 is infinity, so that means d is minus z3. And z, f of z2 is 1, so you can simply say that b is z2 minus z3. So we can map infinity z2 and z3 to 0, 1, and infinity. What about if z2 is infinity? Basically, z1 goes to 0, z2 goes to 1, z3 goes to infinity, right? So first of all, uh, so where does infinity go to? It goes to a by c, and that must go to 1. So that means a is equal to c. So that means f of z is az plus b over az plus d. So since z1, f of z1 is 0, we get this. And since f of z3 is infinity, the denominator must be 0, and we get this. So we can solve that case. So if z3 is infinity, that means infinity goes to infinity. So infinity is a fixed point precisely when c is 0. So it's of the type az plus b. Since f of z1 is 0, this is of this type. And since this is the case, we'll get this. So in other words, uh, so, so we prove the complete result. Namely, we prove that this thing, if this is in the extended complex plane, then you can still map it to this thing. Okay? Therefore, using this, you can prove this expectation. OK? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
Sir, why we are taking uh, 0, 1 and infinity point only? Can we take any other point, uh, uh, 1, 2, 3 or some other points and then can we do these calculations? You can, except the, the, what makes 0 and infinity, first of all, 0 and infinity are very pleasant because uh, if something is 0, you already know the numerator is 0. If something becomes infinity, you know the denominator becomes 0, right? So it's very quick, uh, it's very easy to solve for A, B, and C, and D for 0 and infinity. And 1 is much easier to handle than 2, right? That's why. There's no particular reason other than that. Okay. You can try doing the same things with 1, 2, and 3, but be my guest, but it's much more painful. Right, so we have roughly 10 more minutes. So let's see. Right, so any questions about this particular property? Right? So next, we move on to geometric properties of Mabius maps. So the real question is, uh, maybe, maybe someone pointed or asked me this question that uh, in the last lecture, I think that what about rigid motions? Rigid motions are basically these things that preserve distances in R3 or R2, for example. And what are rigid motions? Rigid motions are basically translations and rotations. Any combination of these, it gives you a rigid motion, right? Uh, so if you ask me the following question, if you take a distance, if you take Euclidean geometry, that is, uh, you take the usual distance on the plane and ask me what quantities, maybe, maybe not like that. What I mean is the following. Suppose I, I, I ask you the following geometric question. Consider translations and rotations. And rotations. And if I ask you the a question of this type. What quantity does not change under translations and rotations? Okay. What quantity does not change under translations and rotations? The distance between two points, right? The distance of between two points is unchanged under translations and rotations. Similar, unfortunately, Mubius maps are not just translations and rotations. They involve scaling, they involve inversions, and so on. So what quantity is invariant does not change under a Möbius map, okay? This is a geometric question. By the way, this question is very closely related to uh, a, 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 a concept in art called perspective. That is, if you if you look if you want to paint a picture of let's say railway tracks, right? Then you'll paint them like this. Okay, these are railway tracks. If you look at uh, maybe maybe if you want uh, if you look at a railway track from here, notice that these two lines, if you look at them in two dimensions, they 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 look like they they they're about to meet, but in reality they don't meet, right? The two railway tracks are parallel. But if you are, if you want to draw a picture. Then you have to draw it like this. This is called perspective. It's like taking a flat piece of canvas and looking at these railway tracks and projecting that onto this flat piece of canvas. And this study of perspective, that is, if I if I look if if from my perspective the railway tracks looks like look like these, if you stand here and you look at these railway tracks and try to paint them, what will you paint? This is an interesting question, right? So the correct answer to this question, these, these questions are part of what is known as projective geometry. And this projective geometry has been, is very closely related to Möbius maps. Okay. So what quantity is invariant under Möbius map? What does this question mean? Under translations and rotations, the distance between any two points on the plane is unchanged. What about for Möbius map? Or in other words, what quantity is in, invariant under perspective? It turns out these two are the same question. Okay. Firstly, let us consider only very simple maps. 
f of z equals a z plus b. What quantity is invariant under this? Such maps are compositions of translations, rotations, and scaling. Right? If there were only translations and rotations, I could have answered this question very easily. The last transformation does not preserve distances. Right? In fact, translations, uh, all right. So, however, it does preserve ratios of distances, right? Scaling. Scaling doesn't preserve distances between two points, but it does preserve the ratios, right? If you take these two, they scale, the ratios are preserved. So let us try checking if this particular complex number is invariant under this map, okay? So uh, it is, that's homework. So this particular com complex number is in fact invariant under this map. Right? I mean, the ratio you would expect it to be invariant, but in fact it's more than that. Okay? The complex number is itself invariant. Right? So Mubius maps uh, take four distinct points to four other distinct points so that take these four distinct points to these four distinct points preserve this what do i mean we have only restricted our attention to these things right what are these kinds of mobius maps these are precisely the mobius maps that fix infinity right they fix infinity and uh, they take uh, z1 z2 z3 to for three other distinct points, W1, W2, and W3, right? So Mubius map that Mubius maps of this type preserve this number. What about any general collection of Mubius maps? What if a Mubius map takes these four points to these four points? What, do, what does it preserve, okay? Now, this is not an easy question to answer. We can, tr we can try trial and error we can, what can we try? We can try, this certainly won't work, right? So surely you have to bring Z4 into the picture somehow. So what we can try is that we can, uh, we can basically see infinity, inf uh, so we, we should have something such that if you substitute Z4 as infinity, you should get, the, you should get this, right? So we can try multiplying this by something of the type z4 minus something divided by z4 minus something else. So we can try z4 minus z1 by z4 minus z2, or we can try something else. It won't work, unfortunately. So we can try z2 minus z4 divided by z1 minus z4. It's not a good idea to try z3 minus z4 by z3 minus z4 because that's stupid. That's just this, okay? So this works. Why does this work? Because I say it does and because that'll be a part of your homework. Yeah, that's why it works, okay? This expression is given a name. It's called the cross ratio of these four points, okay? So the cross ratio of four points is invariant under Mobius maps. The cross ratio in general is invariant under perspective in, in the study of art, that is, okay? in projective geometry, that is. Okay? So since we are out of time, I'll stop here. Any questions? Sir, what is the meaning of invariant? Invariant means that suppose I take, I take a Mobius transformation then these four distinct points will go to four other distinct points under the Mobius transformation, right? I can calculate this quantity for these four points. I can calculate this quantity for those four points also. Namely, I can take W1 minus W3 times W2 minus W4 divided by W2 minus W3 times W1 minus W4. The miraculous thing is these two will be equal. 
That's what invariant means. That means it uh, the, the, this quantity is unchanged under Möbius maps. Is that clear? Uh, yes. <clears throat> so cross ratio, uh, what exactly it represent? Ha, that uh, that is difficult. Even I honestly, even I don't know what it represents. Maybe you can try searching on the internet. And that is why I motivated it like this. The way I did. So if, if infinity is preserved, if you look at these special Möbius maps, then of course, this is the obvious thing to try, right? It doesn't preserve distances, but preserves ratios of distances. So you can try this and it is invariant. Here it's just by trial and error. I don't know if there's any geometric meaning. Maybe there is in terms of circles and straight lines, but I don't know, honestly. Any other questions? I think Sudipta Mazundar might have some question with regard to some uh, stereographic projection. Uh -huh. Let uh, me. Yeah, he is there. Sudip Dr. Sudipta Mazundar, do you have any question? I think he left, it seems. OK. OK, if there are no questions, let us thank uh, Professor Omsi for a very interesting talk. And we have given a very nice view of this conformal mappings. You're welcome. <laughs>